I would now like to introduce our fireside chat on shifting supply chains and trade dynamics. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our sponsor for this session, Food, Health, and Consumer Products. And now I will introduce the moderator for this important discussion, Michael Graydon. And Michael is the president and CEO of FHCP. Michael? Thank you very, very much. Um, welcome to see you all. I'm, I must say, it's, uh, I'll echo the comments of others uh, earlier today. It's extraordinary to be back in public. Um, I haven't enjoyed a buffet lunch like this in a long time. And uh, very, very uh, great experience. Um, we're here to talk about the shifting supply chain and the trade dynamics. And supply chain is, um, it's a terminology that I think all of us live with and all of us converse in, but it's priority in our conversations over the last two years has accelerated quite significantly. And it's an understatement in regards to the dynamics of supply chain and how it's changed. And there's so many factors, whether it be systemic labor issues that we're experiencing across the board, whether it be the inflationary aspects that we're all from farm gate to shelf having to experience, the climate aspects of it, which are having a significant impact. We look at the experiences in British Columbia, with not only the severe heat in the summer, but then the significant rain and flooding that we experienced in the fall, and the impact on the agricultural community in British Columbia, but also the impact in regards to our infrastructure for distribution, with rail lines and key highways being taken out, and uh, our inability for a couple of weeks to be able to get supply either out of British Columbia or into British Columbia. Add to it now the complexity that we're experiencing with the Russian invasion of the Ukraine and the complexity and the challenges that that represents with regards to putting even further impact on a very fragile supply chain around the world. Today, joining us are three experts um, that will talk a little bit about the supply chain as it relates to labor as it relates to the function and movement of goods, as well as the climate impact of it as we move forward. Joining me to my left is Jennifer Griffith. Jennifer's been a leader in skills development training, um, food, food and beverage manufacturing sector for over 20 years. As the Executive Director of Food Processing Skills Canada, she's led the groundbreaking initiatives, including development of the Canadian Food Pro Processors Institute, Food Skills Library, and the Food Cert resources that support education and career pathways for businesses and for people. Next to Jennifer is Randy White. Randy is the president of Cisco Canada. Since 2012, Randy has led Cisco Canada as president, having started his food service career in Vancouver over 40 years ago. Randy is a proud Canadian that sees the true potential and our changing Canadian marketplace and his commitment to service excellent has driven the customer experience to all new highs. And joining us electronically from Princeton University is Tim Searchinger. Tim is a senior research scholar at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. He's also a senior fellow and technical director of the food program at the World Resource Institute. Tim's work today combines ecology, agronomy, economics to analyze the challenge of how to feed a growing world population while reducing deforestation and greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. So we'll start off with a question and we will open up the mics uh, later on in the fireside chat for um, questions from the audience. But let's start with a general question to each of our panelists. And my question is when you look at forward to 2030 and beyond, what current urgent challenge do you see as having the most disruptive effects on Canadian agriculture and the supply chains they depend on? And what does that disruption look like? Jennifer? Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone, for, you know, inviting me to be here amongst you all. Glad to be face-to-face -face as well. It's been way too long. Um, haven't had the opportunity to um, speak in front of your group before, so thank you much to CFA and uh, Scott and the team. Heavy, thought-provoking questions for sure um, that they've put together for us uh, to answer. 
And I would say from uh, our perspective, my opinion is around immigration, diversity, and inclusion. Um, that is going to have a huge impact. It already has, but beyond 2030, we know that um, the main source of our labor will be coming through immigration. Um, and there are definitely things that we need to focus on and have some difficult conversations um, around the integration um, of that. Are transportation systems adequate enough um, to get these individuals to the workplaces that they need to get to? Do we have enough housing and support um, for them coming in? Are our workplaces ready and prepared um, to deal with uh, the variety of settlement um, services that come along with that, um, skills gaps, language barriers, and so forth. What um, are we prepared to uh, accept and actually be able to house all these individuals who will be coming in um, into our workplaces? There are some mindsets, I believe, at the supervisory management level that we need to look at and adjust when it comes to diversity and inclusion um, in all facets um, of the supply chain. So it's not just going to affect processing, it's affecting ag, it's affecting food service, it's going to affect all of us, it affects our communities um, as we speak. Schools are different, education is different, the way we teach is different, um, our landscape is fully changing and you know, urban centers were obviously more equipped for that. Um, but the rural uh, areas where a lot of our uh, businesses are, um, I'm not so sure as much if they are as ready uh, maybe as we are. Randy. We'll Randy? You. Can you hear me okay? How's my, uh, how's my mic? We good? Well, hello everyone. Again, uh, it's great to be here. And like Jennifer, this is uh, an honor to be in front of all of you uh, as I represent kind of the outside direct to uh, the restaurant and hospitality industry of the food, uh, food supply chain at Cisco. And we're, uh, we're just so grateful to all of you in the industry for everything you've been doing the last couple of years in particular. And, and some of you I know have been hit very hard. We've been hit very hard. My restaurant tours have been hit very hard. I was in a restaurant last night in Ottawa and there was two of us in the restaurant and they are eager to get things going again. So I encourage you, when you leave here, please support your local favorite restaurants. They need, they dire need your help to, uh, to carry forward. But this is a great topic, and I'm going to add to the comment on immigration and whatnot. I can tell you as a business leader, I have 6,500 employees across my Canadian organization. We're represented in every major city and a few secondary sites, and every site is desperate. Uh, to add people to the team. I'm right now 950 people short in my business. We pay extremely well. And it's interesting, uh, the minister was up here a few minutes ago and I wasn't gonna put the question up because I have a chance to say things differently. Um, but I can tell you that the federal government and most prov provincial governments are not ready for us. They're not ready to support us right now. They're, they're more interested to understand what this demand is. And I can tell you, it's dire, it's extreme, and coming out of the pandemic, we're gonna be in a real tough spot. And I don't just mean us at Cisco, but the supply chains in general, it's already under extreme pressure. We need support and we need decisions quickly. And so I'm, I'm confident that our governments will see the light soon, but uh, any and all of you that are connected in any ways, please, uh, please understand how big of a deal this is. The restaurant industry, saw 40 to 45% of their candidates leave the industry during the pandemic, and they're not coming back. They've made a decision to go in a different direction. You can ask why and all that. That doesn't help the restaurant industry. We need people, and uh, it's, a, it's a big deal. So I put that out there as, as, uh, as a topic today. The other thing that's uh, quite interesting on disruption in, uh, in uh, supply chain is that people problem is the same in the US, it's the same in Europe, and what it's doing to the supply of what we utilize, whether you're in farming or in supply chain, distribution, warehousing and logistics, all of us, we can't get trucks, we can't get trailers. We can invest in green technology because the organizations to do that don't exist. And so to do that, we need support, again, upstream people, and, uh, 
and funding. So you think about those things. We have a lot of work to do in Canada to, to get that straight. We have great ideas, but what we, we, we forget sometimes is, is how this all connects through the entire supply chain. Um, the other side of this is, uh, you know, the, it was great to hear some of the discussion on, on how the CFA um, and all of you were talking about a better sustainable climate situation, and, and I'm very uh, encouraged by some of the comments I heard. I'm not close to you at all, so I, I'm not sure how long that's been a hot topic, but we're all interested. My organization across the globe, we have over 100,000 diesel-powered distribution vehicles, and you know, if you look at that, you would think, oh my gosh, how can you be so, so disgustingly dirty to the, to the earth? It's the only way today to move goods. It's the only way. However, we announced, if you go on our Cisco website, Cisco with an S, by the way, not a C, we, uh, we announced uh, early this morning that we are partnering in the US with two major uh, producers to create the first refrigerated uh, transport equipment that is entirely uh, non-fossil fuel centered. And this is, we think that we can have this off the ground within the next 12 to 24 months, and we will quickly carry that across our organization. In the background, we've got organizations building trucks today that are green-centered. But that, that whole shift is going to put enormous pressure, not only on the food industry, but all supply chain. All of us in, in logistics and supply chain are eager to get on board. We care about our planet, like all of you, like everyone. And it's time now that we all kind of get our heads around this. But that transition goes back to labor. We need people to be in the, in the production sites, be in the shops, be in the, in, in the engineering rooms um, to help make these decisions, design and implement, test, and move forward with. And so these are, these are big topics, as we all, uh, we all know, uh, impacting the supply chain. Thank you, Randy. Tim? I want to make sure you can hear me fine. Is that OK? We're good. OK. Well, I, I'll, I'll slightly divert your question because I, I was, think I was asked to really address what is the opportunities for dealing with climate change in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. But I think it relates to your question because uh, obviously all countries are under pressure to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions from their, throughout their economies and that includes in the agricultural sector. So I'll just give you a few thoughts on what I think are the opportunities and priorities that are gonna basically affect things. Uh, the general concept, and we only have a few minutes, but I think the single most important factor is actually just making greater re natural resource use. So more output per hectare, greater land efficiency, greater feed efficiency, greater efficiency in the use of nitrogen. Uh, that is ultimately the single key element of the things we can do right now to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions associated with agriculture. Uh, but we have to start pivoting toward innovative technologies. Um, there's only so much you can do uh, with the technologies we have right now. Uh, we need to come up with better ones. There are lots of good ideas out there. I'll just throw you a kind of an interesting example. Um, there is, uh, I know you're under pressure to reduce nitrous oxide emissions from agriculture. Uh, the, you can do that partially by having more efficient uh, use of nitrogen in crop production, and that's in part by breeding, in part by different, uh, by applying nitrogen in smaller amounts more frequently, but that can be expensive. Another way to do it is to inhibit nitrification in the soil, and there are there was a recent paper published about the opportunity to do that in wheat, to breed into wheat a natural property that inhibits the turning of, ammoni of um, uh, ammonium into nitrate. Nitrous oxide comes from the breakdown of nitrate. And if you could slow the conversion from ammonium into nitrate, there are potential both to increase yields uh, and to reduce that nitrous oxide. So that's a technology, just one of many, many technologies that have to be much more seriously advanced or, or else you are going to begin to see kind of serious supply change issues. Um, very briefly, we're um, in our camp, we're, we're doubtful that you can get huge amounts of mitigation from soil carbon sequestration. We think that's tend to be underestimated. Some of the opportunities to do that are certainly cover crops, but I'll just give you one example of 
the, one of the big issues is the difference between sequestering more carbon over the whole landscape versus just doing it on a field. So if you apply manure to your field, you can sequester more carbon, uh, but there's only so much manure and again, it tends to be applied to some field. So if you apply more in one field, it means somebody else is applying less in another field. You don't necessarily get a net gain. And in many of the soil carbon estimates, you see the kind of a similar kind of failure to appreciate the whole system. Although there are some potentials and cover crops are a good example of things that can have you know, higher use. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that there's a kind of a key issue going forward that is of enormous significance to uh, all advanced agricultural systems, which is whether or not the efficiency of land use is appreciated. Now, agriculture uses about half of the world's land and we are clearing land around the globe at a very large rate uh, to produce more food. We need about 50% more food uh, by uh, 2050 or at least 2055. And that means to avoid clearing forests, we need to produce that much more food on the same land. And to do that, we have to try to hold down uh, demand if we can, where we can. And we also need to produce things more efficiently. But land use efficiency is not always factored in or the value of, 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 of producing more on the same land is not factored in, but it's in various ways. So you, you see in the Netherlands, for example, a proposal to by the government to reduce by 30% the a livestock production in the Netherlands, mainly because of nitrogen concerns and that affect the rest of the economy. Uh, but from a greenhouse gas perspective, the Netherlands is a very efficient producer of dairy and pork products. So it, in part because of its very high land use efficiency. So that, while there may be reasons they have to do that, uh, it's actually going to make it appear that the Netherlands are decreasing their greenhouse gas emissions, but they're going to increase overall globally as that food is placed somewhere else. So it's important to appreciate the value of yield, but the corollary to that is that it's important to appreciate the value of avoiding increasing demand. And so the corollary of that is that uh, one of the things that can actually shape the, the supply chain dramatically is continuing increases in biofuels. And particularly now, I think biodiesel. So to give you some idea, there's biodiesel is one of the approved um, uh, fuels in many cases viewed for aviation, but that's based on ignoring the fact, basically ultimately the fact that it takes land to produce that. And that land that you're using to do that has to come from somewhere. And that land, uh, if it comes and any kind of additional conversion of land is likely to cause a lot more greenhouse gas emissions for at least 30 years than you save for replacing the aviation fuel. Well, if uh, even uh, one half of aviation fuel would have come from bio uh, diesel, basically vegetable oil, you'd have to triple global production of vegetable oil. So that would basically have gigantic consequences for the cost of everybody else trying to use vegetable oil plus land use. So I think one of the key uh, issues is, do we appreciate land use efficiency, which on the one hand means that countries like Canada that produce food efficiently, in part because they have good yields, uh, that agriculture is appreciated for that efficiency and encouraged to be even more efficient. But on the other hand, it means not having competing demands uh, for food that can, uh, uh, will lead to further agricultural expansion and have uh, other kinds of consequences. So I th those are just a little summary of some of the key issues I think facing us for, for climate and agriculture. Thank you, Tim. Um, Jennifer, um, I'll turn to you first and ask you, um, have you seen the labor situation, as you've seen the labor situation evolve recently from, for Canadian food processors, how much of this is COVID related and how much of this is a longer term phenomena and what does this mean for farmers and the rest of the supply chain? I don't know about speaking to the farmer side, but I know for uh, the processors, um, I would be remiss if we blame this on the COVID-19 situation. Um, yes, it has highlighted that, accented it more, but we've had a labor crisis for a long time. And um, COVID has just highlighted a few things that 
you know, I think that we need to do, that we can change, that we can adapt. We were very uh, flexible and adaptable, I think, in the approach and things that we needed to change. Um, they were very, our industry is very resilient, but labor, uh, our perceptions, number one, we, work, we have a hard working environment, right? I'm sure similar to your farms as well, our environment, it, you have hot environments, cold environments, you know, it can be anything in between um, the perceptions of doing that hard work. We know that three out of 10 Canadians would consider working in our industry. Um, farmers are seen very highly, actually. I think they're one of the top three occupations in terms of trustworthiness um, amongst Canada. Um, but then if we only have three out of 10, and then even in Quebec, it's one out of 10 who would consider even working in our industry. So we have an issue right there with awareness and perception. Um, we have hard paying, well, we have hard jobs or hard types of jobs with, I would say, a lower pay. Um, a lot of employers are working on changing that, adapting that to get, you know, the starting rates, um, wage rates higher. I don't think we pay as well as our friends here at food service. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, we have to work uh, on that because right now it is an employee job seeker world right now. Uh, they have so many options, so many opportunities. Um, you know, a lot of our employees are transitioning to other sectors um, since this has happened. So they have a lot of choices with a lot of higher paying jobs as well. Um, we have to make some changes at the workforce, um, workforce level um, in terms of, I think, the supervisory and management level skills. Are we um, dealing with the individual? We're talking about the societal piece, the well-being piece. Um, the individual, many of our supervisors transition from the line to supervisory position without understanding um, teamwork, collaboration, um, you know, having those critical conversations and so forth. So there's, um, I think, definitely some work there that needs to be done um, to ensure that uh, we can keep moving forward and ahead, dealing with these HR issues. Um, are critical uh, to keeping our people. I think there have been a lot of people that come through the door, but we haven't been able to retain them. Our retention rates are high, they're around 14%, um, according to our data. The vacancy rate is a whole nother issue that can range from region to region. Um, I believe in our friends at the Canadian Meat Council just did a study where they have a 33% vacancy rate in Quebec alone amongst their meat processing facilities. Um, I do know that across the board we have 14%. There's some saying 20, 25%. So it definitely varies um, across regions. Um, but how are we going to tackle all of these monumental issues? It is definitely a collaborative team effort. Partnership is the new leadership. Uh, we do need to all work together um, to make any change to advance the needle um, in this area. But um, it is dire and it is critical, but it has been critical for a long time. And how do we change that going forward? Yes, please do. Yeah. Go ahead. But it, it is critical and it's interesting you know, if you go back 20 years ago and then 10 years ago in different parts of the country and how we were thinking about these things because there were shortages in different parts of Canada, particularly in Alberta, we saw just an enormous shortage which drew Canadians across the country into northern Alberta in the oil and gas industry and then it went back. But what's interesting about that whole cycle is that we are not producing more people to fill the slots for the, for the production and farming and growing side, for the supply chain side, for all the industries that are very dependent on, on labor. And so we must change our immigration and foreign worker and whatever else we create to be a sustainable, positive channel for us. This country was built on that, and I don't understand why it's taking us so long as a, as a Canadian, or Canadian um, employer industry to figure out how to get this right. And you know, we've got lots of, of special interest groups concerned about what that'll do to the country and, and all that. It's absolutely 
those are real things that we need to talk through. But at the end of the day, we need people. It's, it's numbers, right? So anyways, um, we'll just, we'll, I'll pause on that. I, I think I, I'll continue to wave this flag until we see light at the end of the tunnel. We had solutions under the pre previous federal government that got thrown out the window. And now we're right back to where we are. We have less people today. And we're coming out of, out of a pandemic and everybody wants to build their, uh, their businesses back and their, their livelihood back because we blew it all. We had to spend it all during the pandemic. And now it's, uh, it's a tough situation. So um, anyways, a good topic. We could talk all day on this one, but uh, uh, I think I was also asked to comment on the digitization of supply chain. And um, I will do that. It's really, it's actually an exciting, positive topic as we think about where we were two years ago this month and where we are today. As you, as you think back to the start of the pandemic and all the positive things going on around the world on, on technology and what it was bringing forward and green discussions of green technology and all those things. And so much of that got stalled, stopped, and then rejuvenated. And we're just seeing an acceleration of exciting things coming. And in supply chain, in fact, the labor shortage is, a, is influencing a lot of this as well. You know, how do we move goods and manage goods um, to keep up with the pace of demand differently? And if you look at Amazon, all of you, I'm sure, have bought things online. I can't imagine anybody that hasn't during the pandemic. But uh, as we speak today, retail industry has changed forever. It's absolutely, completely changed forever. And so every Canadian is very comfortable. And even if you're uncomfortable, every Canadian is very comfortable shopping online. Uh, if you're uncomfortable, you're more comfortable today than you were two years ago. I guarantee it. And most Canadians, it's the only way they shop. What that's giving us is an incredible demand data, real-time demand data. And as we're aggregating this data as business, we're starting to ask others out in industry and in association groups to collect data and bring data together so we can understand upstream where the signals lie on, on supply chain so we can lower our inventories, be more efficient. And I think of the farming uh, communities and understanding how that makes its way all the way back to Prince Edward Island, wherever our gentleman from PI is, and talking through how to get signals right so that crops meet demand and don't miss the cues that come through digitization. It's absolutely the answer. And so I'm very excited about where that's going. And, and I'll say this, I think most of you can expect more of that because business, us, we are interested in collaborating through the whole connection of, of this to, to make sure that the demand data meets the supply. Uh, the other thing we're seeing so much of today is with the labor challenges, how do we automate steps in pieces of the supply chain. So it's interesting to hear Elon Musk, and you've, most of you have heard of Elon Musk, who created the, uh, uh, the first commercial electric uh, automotive industry and uh, it, with the Tesla uh, brand. But it's interesting, his passion around driverless vehicles that scares the heck out of all of us, it's real. It's just around the corner. One of the toughest jobs to fill, other than farming, I'm sure, um, other than farming, is truck drivers. There's a dire shortage of truck drivers in the world, across the world. It's extreme in the United States. It's seriously concerning in Canada. And in Britain and uh, parts of the, the, the greater UK where we do a lot of business, it's, uh, it's an extreme disaster. And it's interesting to see how as more and more people have decided they don't want to get into the truck driving industry and that demand has gone up and the supply has gone down. The willingness to look at the driverless technology is now opening up. And so all I say is I predict that there will be a day very soon in the next couple of years, if not sooner, where we will have driverless deliveries. It will start with vans and smaller vehicles that are less concerning but still dangerous in my view but at the same time have the potential to be perfect and precise and allow you to get a delivery. You make your way out to the curb, you open the truck, you take your goods off because there's no people to do that. And the truck goes on its way to the next stop. And these are the kinds of things that we have in front of us to really help us in supply chain think through a better future where we can keep goods, food in particular, moving to consumers, moving to the end. The other, the other thing in this is this idea of omni-channel which Amazon's another ex example of this, is that when you 
when you order goods, excuse me, when you buy, purchase goods in the past, you would go to your favorite grocery store, your favorite retailer, and you would pick out what you wanted and go to the front, pay for it, take it home, and, and uh, you're all happy. But the reality of Omnichannel now is that with online ordering, those retail outlets are going to be reduced. I mean, you can see it in Ottawa here, there's gonna be less places to go and shop. There will probably be at least one brand left where you can go, if you, those of you that wanna to touch and feel, you can go do that, the rest will buy online. What that's gonna do upstream to supply chain is move around where the goods come from. It's gonna take out steps, it's gonna create efficiencies, lower cost um, in terms of real estate, uh, carbon footprint, all the pieces along the way in a very positive way for the consumer. And this is what Amazon is forced upstream through their system. You know, you order three things from Amazon and one delivery arrives, but they actually didn't come from the same place. They linked up through digit, uh, digitization, and uh, it's very exciting to see that coming, coming forward. And then just lastly, I'll comment on it because this is such a big deal for all of us, and Tim's talked a lot about this. The piece on how do we use uh, the digitization and innovation to drive green technology. It's not that it's exciting that it might be coming. It's coming. It has to come. There's no other way. The innovation piece is the only way through this. We have to innovate rapidly or we're, we're not going to catch up. We're behind today as, as a globe, as we all know, and we're all eager to do the right things, right? We are, and maintain our livelihood. And so we need to bring innovation forward with with heavy green investment, and it's going to change supply chain dramatically, but it's very exciting uh, to think about that into the future. I'll pause there, Michael. No, thank you, Randy, and I think that's a good segue, Tim, as we continue to see increased emphasis on climate change with respect to what we eat and how it's produced, specifically the need for carbon neutral or net zero production. How would you summarize the key changes needed to reduce agricultural greenhouse gas emissions and which of those changes you see as being most challenging or disruptive to adapt or adopt with respect to current North American agricultural practices? Thanks. Well, I partially, I guess, answered your question a little bit in my first answer. Uh, the, uh, it, it is worth talking specifically about uh, cows. <laughs> so as we all know, uh, cattle are a, uh, very large source of the greenhouse gas emissions associated with agriculture. Globally, about 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions with agriculture are from ruminants, and that's in for methane and also some of the nitrous oxide from the urine they deposit, a little bit from manure management, and particularly in dairy systems, but also pork, of course. And um, they also are the bulk of the land use and land is a very valuable commodity. So the challenge is uh, that. Now, globally, there are large increases coming for sure in demand for, for ruminant meat, beef. So it's not as though the demand is gonna go away, but it is very important that we hold down the increased consumption of that. So then the question is, okay, we want to do that, but then what about the production side? So does that mean, for example, that Canadian beef producers shouldn't be producing beef? And the answer is no. And the reason is uh, we're probably gonna need more beef. And Canada is a pretty efficient producer of beef. And so Canadian beef producers should also be producing beef. Okay, so then the question is, what do you do to reduce those greenhouse gas emissions? Well, there are really only two things you can do. And one is to feed cows more efficiently. Canada's a pretty efficient feeder today, but I think it is possible uh, to breed cows and to make further improvements in the feed conversion efficiency, which is a key factor. Ultimately, the methane and the land use are pretty closely associated with the simple quantity of feed that you do to produce a, a pound or kilogram of, of beef. The other will be uh, to reduce the methane emissions from enteric fermentation and then somewhat from the manure in, in dairy systems. And there, frankly, we have some, a few promising uh, components of uh, uh, options. One is this new uh, uh, drug, basically, uh, Ovair is the brand name, and that has yet to be proved in Canada. And the other could be something related to red algae, which has also shown some promise for, for increasing feed conversion efficiency. 
But the reality is that they're a long way from being approved and being tested properly. And frankly, there's a simple thing that we need, which is we need roughly a $100 million coordinated program across multiple countries to test those products and a couple others in a very clear way for two, two to three years. And, uh, and then to be able to prove that they're safe, see what they do in different contexts. And that's an example though, of what we're lacking. That's really all we need, uh, or at least for, for now, um, about a hundred million dollars globally. And we haven't been able to produce that. You have tiny sized um, studies of these. So I would say that, and then on the, on the manure side, there has been too much of an emphasis on biogas, mainly because it's just expensive. Uh, and it's particularly expensive as a mitigation technique in colder environments like Canada. I did a big report in Denmark where the, the level of methane coming out of the manure is smaller than it is in let's say North Carolina. So we need cheaper options. And there are cheaper options. The, well, acidification is one option. In the long run, there are opportunities to use manure to make higher value products. And that, uh, and there, there's some suggestion of really a fairly modest amount of, of, um, of sulfate being added. There are various options for that. Uh, also high, highly efficient forms of uh, solid separation. Again, the amount of money being put into that is tiny. Talk, a lot of talk, very little action. So these would be, I think, the opportunities, uh, uh, the biggest opportunities. Ultimately, livestock are really a critical component. And I already mentioned, although there's a longer discussion of the options for nitrogen use, which would be the other big source of, of production emissions. And last thing though, I would say is ultimately efficient use of land from a global perspective is really important. It's not factored into countries' analysis. If you produce more food and export more food, and as a result, make it possible so that countries don't have to clear as much land in growing countries or, or let's say China gets something from you and therefore doesn't buy something from Brazil and therefore doesn't contribute to clearing land in Brazil. In effect, you have helped save land in Brazil. Uh, you get no credit for that. And that is a problem. As a flip side is you get no blame if you take your crops instead of feeding people, you turn them into biofuels. Uh, and so factoring land use into this and the efficient use of land is important. And that's so, I, so these are a bunch of considerations, but ultimately it's in the Canadian agriculture's interest to focus on that because you are an exporter, you are an efficient producer and you want the world to appreciate that. So we need to account for that properly and continue to encourage increased yields basically. Thank you, Tim. We'll um, open it up to the audience, if you have any questions, please um, come to the mics. Jennifer, both you and Randy have talked about labor at great lengths. It impacts the supply chain quite significantly. Use the term dire. Um, if you were to have recommendations to the government today, how would we expedite immigration, both from an economic perspective, but also temporary foreign workers, in the short term to alleviate this, because I don't sense it's a long-term solution. It, it is a short term, it has to be fixed soon, or this fragile nature of the supply chain will start to decay even further. Well, the cap, they need to expand the cap. The cost for the applications are ridiculous. At $1,000 a pop, that needs to be removed. Um, and we just need to increase, just allow so many to come in to fill these needs. We now have, you know, ultimate, before it was mainly meat, seafood processors who access this program the most on the processing side. Um, they're the heavy users of it. Um, but now you're seeing the bakeries, you're seeing all different other sectors now coming on board, wanting to fill out these applications, get them in. They're having a hard time with it. It's being stagnated and stopped. We have the chairman of our board on the East Coast, who is a baker, he's short 20 people right now. Um, can't find them anywhere in Moncton. Um, filled out how many LMI applications, everything's on hold, just seems to be stalling, stalling, stalling. So um, I know there are lobby groups um, who are together uh, going and activating or 
going actively to government on this. Um, hopefully we'll see some changes shortly um, in the short term. I do know it is not a long-term solution, um, but we want these people and we want them to stay and we want them to bring their families and build communities and so forth. So um, in that sense, we do want to see that um, happen and uh, change our communities and increase livelihood there. Randy, anything further? Yeah, a few pieces to add to that. And I, I think uh, it's from my own experience. I started a file in September. It's now six months with 30 names on it. I hired 30 people by name in Mexico that worked for me seven years ago in northern Alberta who had to leave when the program, foreign worker program in this particular industry was, was scrapped, who were eager to come back because they've been jobless since in Mexico. And I just got it approved three weeks ago by the provincial government that we are working on. And uh, we're told any day now it'll come through the federal. I think it's a resource issue. I don't think anyone's standing in the way. Uh, we need more people working on these files. We need more people, more resources. We have to check. We have to check where these people are coming from. We have to do all that. That's important. And I get all that. I'm not asking for shortcuts. I'm actually asking for a, uh, an important new component to be stood up for 12, 24 months and then re-looked at where this is at. Immigration is one side of it. Foreign worker is the other. Working together and put more people who can make decisions on the job. And that'll get us through that. You talk about the uh, meat producers. Uh, my number one partners in my supply chain in our food industry are meat producers and, and produce of many kinds. They've, they've been hitting their head against the wall for three years, it's been so bad. And when I talk about 1,000, they talk about 3,000 people short. Like th these are the kind of numbers. And it's funny because when we, when we lobby and discuss with more senior government officials in the provinces and in Canada, they just say, well, that's just the way it is. Well, that's just not good enough anymore. It's, it's simply not good enough. We're a great uh, country, and we need to be greater at supporting our supply chains. And you, you can see what happens when a few cracks in the supply chain system happens. The BC situation that just happened recently, I live that by the hour in, in our industry. And it, uh, it's, it's telling on how fragile we are as a country. And we have work to do. Um, but the, the other side of that related to labor is just amazing. It, uh, it's it's going to need more of an investment by the federal and provincial governments. Yeah, it is a challenging time. You know, the members that I represent represent about 80% of what you see on grocery shelves and pharmacy shelves. We're over 30,000 vacant positions within the manufacturing facilities, and that number's going up, and uh, it, it is very challenging. So, question from the floor. Well, I want to say, wow. Um, what is it? We need more poor people at the table. Like, just phenomenal. Yes, that, I think that's sometimes missed in a lot of this. Um, you should run for office. <laughs> Uh, it's really empowering seeing people of your caliber here today, and I thank you very much. Because there's not a big lineup, I have two questions, and I'll move if you need me to. No worries. One of them is, and again, I see Cisco trucks in my neighborhood, which is rural and an hour northwest of here um, in rural Ontario on the Quebec border. And um, whenever we are talking about attracting and retaining new Canadians, whether coming from the urban centers here out to the country or bringing someone from afar, and I like the idea, what is it? Canadians are born all over the world, just some of them take longer to get here. And uh, so the key is, is how do we create that welcoming community when we are already short on resources, especially in terms of social services, housing, transportation? Is there an opportunity for you as pillars in our community and stakeholders to kind of help prime the pump, to help you know, where we can come together, both at our local agricultural systems, our social structures, and uh, and you folks to be able to actually move this. We have the the we have the interest and the and the, the on the ground roots, but we don't have the organizational structures. Could you speak to whether or not you see an opportunity there, or what kinds of vehicles might work, especially because like, we don't even have anything to help with translation services. You know, just the basics, even just the culture shocks of grocery stores. Right. That, 
whole settlement piece is huge. So you have the larger companies who have the benefits of being able to do that, right? And help integrate these individuals. Um, with some of these smaller rural locations. So you have places like Oxford in Nova Scotia who has started to bring in about 65 you know, new immigrants. They weren't sure how it was gonna work with the community, getting them settled in, but the community rallied around them and supported them. You know, we have a lot of tools and things that we've developed, like cultural handbook tool, you know, how to integrate those coming in, dealing with English as a second language, obviously is a big piece too. So we're developing um, 10 courses in six different languages to be able to help with that integration of food safety practices, the Canadian workplace culture norms and so forth. So. We're working with different um, immigrant serving agencies, um, employment development groups and so forth to provide them with some of these resources and tools, but really it's an economic development thing in your city or your region or your area um, to really help pull all these pieces together. Um, I could say for us that you know ESDC is supporting us in the development of these tools and you know for workforce development dealing with new canadians diversity inclusion and so forth so um we're doing our best to spread the word with that and the resources and tools um but it does take a lot of people to make it happen and i would add you know as an employer again a, a, biz, a good business is going to look ahead of those things and say what do i need to have on the ground to welcome these new people uh, language you know, all of my supervision in one location in Canada, the, the very first time we brought folks in from Mexico and then from the Philippines, we had them all immersed in language training and to the point they could at least uh, get through um, speaking Spanish and uh, uh, two different Filipino connections. Um, and that wasn't easy, but we did that as an effort. And I think, you know, maybe there's a, a, a combination of checking what companies that are getting approved and perhaps giving a, a, a certain level of, of appro approval given the different services and support systems that they stand up because today a lot of those services don't exist. Yeah. Um, depends on the country we're pulling from and the level of need that those people have and how they set that up could give them a certain status and encourage companies to build a best practice framework at one time, I rented 95 condominiums in Edmonton and at no cost to the new Canadian, put them in them and we held those for one year and then we found out they weren't good at cooking on a, you know, a standard North American stove, so we brought them in different ways to do things. We learned along the way. I think we're a good employer that does good things and adapts well to what we need to take care of our people and I know by the retention of those people that they wanted to stay. And so I, I don't know what the right answer is, but I think we need to talk about these things. I think you need to put it on the employer, somehow on the employer. And when I say you, I mean us as Canadians, the government of Canada, the provinces, put it on the employer. It's all co the cost of doing business. Some people will not agree with me. Smaller business people will not agree with me. This is what it's going to take. And then maybe we can find a way as communities grow and populations grow, they stand on their own. They stand on their own and they support each other and they're on their way, just like we were on our way and our forefathers were on our way at some point along the last couple hundred years. And it all fits into that. The other thing is I think you need to talk about it loudly if there's issues developing. And you know, I think that's what Canada's all about. Put, put it out there, get, get it out in the media, talk about it, challenge the government and business. Don't close the door. Challenge the issue, not, not the demand, right? And that's, that's what we need to do. We do have someone, so I'll just ask okay. a quick Good question. Yeah. And it was simply, a lot of the staff that we do have now are all having to do way too many jobs, and our resilience is already tested, yeah. both at the management level and at the floor level. How are you managing this, or is this something where it's quite likely we will see more upheavals and just try to reattract re people. Like, do you do you try to stem the bleeding, or just uh, accept that this is a process that may be happening everywhere, and and we'll just try to build build it back better. Not to take any politic slander or anything like that, but just kind of curious about how you're perceiving this. And maybe it's a bit of both, given the scope of your businesses. 
it's a two-edged sword, <laughs> you know, like, you, you have to deal with both at the same time. I don't think it can be one um, or the other, right? So, yes, companies, they, they're going to hire, you're going to do your interviews, you're going to do the same thing they've always done to get people and attract, but what about the ones you currently have? You have to give them some security, you need to give them an opportunity for continuous development, improvement, um, you know, be flexible. I think there was um, an article that just came out in the National Post last Friday about what employees are looking most from their employers was flexibility during this time. Are we flexible um, at our current work environments? I know, you know, we have the lines to run at certain times and so forth, but is there a way to be more flexible? Can we continue to support our current workers to let them improve, get them promoted, keep them learning, mentor others, and so forth? So um, we have to, you have to do that. We have to take that time to provide those um, services or tools or what livelihood they, they demand that they need it. So it takes a lot of support. We are doing that currently um, with a pilot in the East Coast where we're training on emotional intelligence skills with supervisors, frontline workers. Um, we have over 400 supervisors enrolled in this program and it's working. They're seeing the changes on the floor. They're seeing the communications happen better. Um, the supervisors are really like, okay, what's so important about happiness or active listening or empathy? And they're actually trying it out on the floor. They're hearing from their coworkers. They're listening to them. They're not just dismissing them. So, but it does take, like, that's the support from the government that we're actually able to provide these companies with these resources and tools. But the hand-holding is a lot. It's one-on-one -on -one support with each of these companies who are on board with that. Thank you, Jennifer. Hello, um, my name's uh, Rudy Meyer from the BC Ag Council. I'm a chair of the BC Young Farmers. And uh, yeah, I've been enjoying the conversation you guys have been having lately and you know, speaking on behalf on you know, the supply chain and labor shortage and then saying how you know, you're seeing people being pushed away from you know, your industry. And, and that's just something that's been really happening lately. And, you know, I roll a whole bunch of stuff down, but I'm probably gonna try to cut through it. But like, you know, the effective labor, you know, it's been through like dairy, trade, uh, mills, even the younger generation have been affected by that. You know, I go to my local restaurant and most of the servers are in their teens, 15 to 17, and you, which I applaud them. You know, I encourage them. I have a 17 year old daughter, crazy enough, as young as I am. But you not know, on the side that she also works for me, she does other things on the side and you know it's part of just what's growing in our generation um the bc government has been lucky enough that in agriculture now that there's paid sick leave you know up to five days that's encouragement you know and, and like you said randy uh, investment oh, business owners employers need to invest if we're willing to reach out and have uh, foreign workers come into our businesses for a lower cost, we should be able to cover the cost in between for carrying those things as housing and training. And, and like you said, Jennifer, on uh, you know, being a leader and learning those things where you need to learn to listen to your employees and train. And yeah, it is a lot of hand-holding. I've learned that myself. I've now two years with foreign workers. It's not that easy. You t they don't just come and you point. There's every, every month, every three months, I have a I have an evaluation with them. I have a meeting with them one-on-one. -on -one. I find out, okay, what's going on? What do you need? You know, do you need this for your housing? Do you need this to achieve your goals? What do I need of you? Um, um, Tim, you know, I was look, listening along you about uh, Greenway and accessibility with propane and natural gas and things how we are looking for ways to run a different fueling system, of course. Agriculture is 99% by diesel. Everything's run on diesel. You know, we see this here that the fuel costs are increasing, but trying to find a way where we can mitigate um, natural gas to be sub subsidized into that system for heating or, or cooling or even generating trucks to pull things around for deliveries would be uh, exciting. Um, you know, partnering with businesses such as Forest and BD, BC Hydro or Hydroelectric in order to regenerate methane, electricity be put back in the system. Um, you know, I was looking through other things on 
uh, transit and uh, accessibility for these foreign workers. If we, if we live in rural areas, how are we gonna get them? Where are their housing gonna be, right? But also taking care of it, that they know how to take care of the housing. It's uh, funny that you mentioned that, Randy, about condos and having foreign workers. I have a friend down the road where they had, they built like literally a hotel for them. And one of them actually bought a propane cooking stove top. You know what happened? They burned the whole hotel down. <laughs> and it was sad, but you know, it's, it's one of those things where you go unchecked, where you know, us as a society in Canada, we're so fortunate to, to know how to use all these appliances and then to show something new to a person that's not essentially a third world country, but you know, they don't have that training. So it's, it's very exciting and I definitely enjoyed your guys' uh, conversation that you had. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, we're drawing to the conclusion here and I'll, I'll just ask our panelists to sort of provide us with a closing remark for the group. And in your remarks, I'd ask you to end with a single message you believe is the most critical takeaway for farmers and their supply chain partners. Tim, can we start with you, please? Not sure I've offered a lot of good advice on the supply chain. So why not defer? That's really the focus here. I'll defer to my co-panelists. Okay, Randy. Okay, so just a couple of last thoughts. First and foremost, I appreciate the comments earlier. I've forgotten your name, I'm sorry, but uh, it's great to see young farmers represented and uh, I encourage uh, many more to follow with you and, and be great. We, you know, as I open today, my comments around, I, I'm so grateful at the Canadians that produce, um, and I say that specifically, I actually think it's exciting that there are trade wars going on because I believe that Made in Canada is gonna become a big deal. It's, uh, it's it, you know, with the free trade agreements and all the different things that have been going on in the last 30, 35 years that many businesses were pro and excited about because it lowered input costs to a certain extent. We've traded away so much of our, uh, of our production and I'm so excited about that. We can't do it without labor, we know that. So key takeaways is made in Canada is something that we need to be open to, I believe that. And I encourage you to really you know, increase your agility on, on foreign workers, on immigration, and um, doing more at home and considering what that means to our great country. It's, uh, I think we're heading into another era of, of more independence as a country. And so, the, the impact on the supply chain will be very significant, but, but positive at the same time. And then second, the uh, willingness to move faster on climate changing technology improvements that we just simply must experiment with, not wait and see. We don't have time anymore to wait and see. We need to get on with things. And it's as simple as that. And so, you know, how do, how do we do that? So it comes with willingness and agility and, and uh, belief that we have to do something. So I'll, I'll end at that one. Jennifer? I'm excited about where we are, where we are right now um, in this time. Change is inevitable, but change starts with us at the end of the day. Wherever we may sit, wherever position you might be in, if you were in government, whichever government department, the minister's office, so forth, what can you do to start this change? What can we do to affect policy change? Um, what can we do from a skills development perspective? What type of resources, tools, what can we do to start? Let's just get going. We're just tired of this talking, talking, talking. It's constant talking. We have these meetings. We come out with these numerous reports. And what happens? Do we have the action that follows through um, with it? So, you know, we can all... It's all time for us to pull up our socks, work together, change um, starts with us, and we have the solutions. Well, it's always perfect to end on a positive note with positive comments. I think there is uh, some true optimism. It is time for change. The toolkits that we had in the past don't work anymore. Um, renting condominiums and building hotels to house workers, um, those types of things are, are very, very critical. I would suggest, Randy, that Made in Canada is already here. We have a worldwide reputation for some of the best agricultural and produced products in the world. And it's a tremendous opportunity to leverage as we continue to move forward. I know from the industry that I represent, what we do need to do is incentivize more manufacturing in this country. We've lost a lot of manufacturing over the last 20 years. And the abilities to be able to take the riches of our agricultural um, output 
and process that for Canadians in a more self-sufficient way um, is a real opportunity, I think, for this country. And as we start to look at a lot of the protectionism that's going on, especially with our neighbors south of the border, the more self-sufficiency that we can build into this country, I think we will then have more food security, which also is an important aspect in regards to moving forward. My sincere thanks to Jennifer, Randy, and Tim, and thank you very much um, for your time joining us this afternoon. Thank you.